Good evening. Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to the Center for Student Leadership, Experiential Education and Citizenships, Frederick van Sel Slabbert Honorary Lecture. As always, the annual Honorary Lecture provides a platform for engaging conversation on South African governance matters. And tonight, the 11th Honorary Lecture will be no exception, with student leaders, staff, alumni, scholars, media, and members of the public joining us from across South Africa, and again, from various countries online. To ensure that uh, all protocol will be observed, I will now hand over to my co-program director, Mr. Yeki Musmetani, who is the multicultural educator at the Center for Student Communities, to introduce our Rector and Vice Chancellor, Professor Wim de Villiers, to do the official welcome on behalf of Stellenbosch University. And over to you. Thank you, Heidi. Good evening, colleagues, distinguished guests. It gives me a great honor and pleasure to introduce our rector, Provim de Villiers, to the gathering here. Provim de Villiers has been a rector and vice chancellor of Stellenbosch University since 2015 when he joined his alma mater again after more than two decades abroad. Now, after graduating from Selmish University with an MBCHB, Prof went to Oxford University for his PhD and then to America where he studied at Harvard and had several senior positions at the University of Kentucky, including head of gastroenterology and administrative head of the Good Samaritan Hospital. Prof, Vim, was included in the publication of Best Doctors in America, Prof. <laughs> Prof uh, was appointed Dean of Health Sciences at the University of Cape Town in July 2013 and returned to South Africa before joining US in his current position. Quickly on the national stage, Prof. Vim has served as chairperson of the Finance and Investment Committee of, Uni of Universities of South Africa, chair of higher health, and on an international stage as council member of the Association of Commonwealth Universities. Prof, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and good evening, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I was thinking back when he introduced me and he said I've been uh, vice rector and vice chancellor since uh, 2015. It uh, is probably not a coincidence that it was uh, that I became vice chancellor on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day, 2015. <laughs> so, and that's, I've often, um, often reflected on that. So, but welcome to, to this very special event and the honorary lecture of the Frederick von Slubber Institute. In particular, I would like to welcome our guest speaker, Ms. Takani Maluleke, the Auditor General, will be delivering this evening's lecture and her daughter, Naledi, uh, Mr. Chris Endries uh, from the Conrad Adenauer Foundation or the Stiftung, and the Stiftung is the sole sponsor of the Friedrich von Seltzlaber uh, Honorary Lecture. Professor uh, Brian Figaji, trustee of the A.B. Bailey Trust, and the trust is the Institute's main donor. Tanya Slubber, daughter of von Seltzlaber, will, uh, will be joining us online. And there are several members from the rectorate, the senior directors here, alumni joining us in South Africa and from abroad, and also students and staff. So welcome to you all. So tonight's uh, topic is, is very important. It's about uh, good governance and good citizenship and what South Africans require for engaged citizenship. Now it's a, it's a loaded topic, it's a contentious topic. Um, it's a potentially controversial topic. Uh, but with the upcoming general elections on the horizon in 2024 in South Africa, the Institute's annual lecture takes on some very important added significance. Because as citizens prepare to exercise their democratic right to vote, it's paramount that there should be informed decision making. So at Stellenbosch University, uh, we strive to create and sustain pathways for our students 
to become engaged citizens, to be of service to society, who contribute to their communities in meaningful, meaningful ways. I mean, I think everybody knows what Stellenbosch is, is good at, and is generally known at what universities are good at, but a much more, much more vexing question is what are universities actually good for? What is Stellenbosch good for? And that is where we want to make a real impact as a university in service of society in and for Africa. And we position ourselves as an educational leader on the continent, and it's in line with our vision to support the development of leadership in Africa and also to cultivate active citizens who contribute to a socially just and sustainable society. So, as we all know, our continent, our country, uh, has a young population, so we have a youth bulge. I've just come back from an extended uh, visit overseas where I've been both to Canada and I've been to Japan, visiting universities and being part of networks of universities in Canada, uh, the Association of Commonwealth Universities and visited Toronto and Ottawa, and in Japan, in uh, Tokyo and Hiroshima, uh, being part of uh, the international network of universities there. And in both those two societies, it's the converse. Um, they're more elderly there, so there's not that youth bulge. But they also deal with the similar issues in a increasingly polarized world uh, as to what the challenges are that we face in terms of a socially just and sustainable society. So, but there's no question in democracies globally, there is enormous power, and in South Africa, especially in the youth vote. Because students and young people across the country have the power to determine South Africa's future by either showing up or ignoring the ballot box, as we see increasingly is ignoring the ballot box, and that needs to be turned around. But, so we have to get them to show up and to exercise the democratic right that previous generations have fought so hard for and that that is of the utmost importance. And this is something that Dr. Friedrich von Selsleben knew well. His legacy remains profoundly relevant as South Africa prepares to commemorate 30 years of democracy. His ideals of dialogue, inclusivity, democratic values, and sound governance continue to have an impact and to shape the ways we address our numerous challenges, but also how we think about the future. And our commitment to honoring his legacy through the institute that carries his name, reflects our dedication to academic excellence, to democratic values, and the promotion of responsible citizenship. He was a remarkable man, and his contribution as an agent of change in the recent history of our country cannot be underestimated. And if we can only instill a little bit, a little bit of his passion in our students, it will surely go a long, long way. So I'm always excited to attend this lecture. I always gain new insights from this lecture, and I really look forward to hearing Ms. Malilaki's remarks. So welcome, thanks to you all for coming, and let's move forward together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Wim, uh, for those kind words and setting the scene. And I think, Prof, you're absolutely correct. It's not only instilling a sense of passion in young people, but in all of us, that uh, the legacy of the art, the late, great Frederick von Sels Lubbard should and sh uh, will have. 
Colleagues, I now have the pleasure in also inviting our Deputy Vice um, Chancellor for Learning and Teaching, Prof. Deresh from Juggernaut, to also contextualize the lecture. Briefly as well with Prof. Deresh, um, he holds a BSc degree in engineering, chemical that is, from the then University of Natal, which he obtained in 93, and also obtained his PhD in chemical engineering at the same University of Natal in 2001. Prof. Diresh was appointed full professor of chemical engineering at the age of 31. This is in January 2004 at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He is currently the deputy vice chancellor in and teaching at Samush University, and prior to his appointment at Samush University, he was the deputy vice chancellor of research and pro vice chancellor of innovation, commercialization, and entrepreneurship at the same University of KwaZulu-Natal. Prof. Deresh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yuki, for that introduction. Uh, good evening to the Rector and Vice-Chancellor, Professor Wim de Villiers, our guest speaker this evening, uh, Ms. Uh, Sakani Moluleke, all our distinguished guests, colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to provide some background and context to the Frederick von Sales Slabbert uh, Annual Lecture. Now, this event is sponsored by the Conrad uh, Adenio Stiftung and is hosted to honor the late uh, Dr. Slabbert's legacy and to create a, a platform to engage critically with current South African political and governance issues. Now, Dr. Van Sale Slabbert's reputation as an agent of change in the recent history of South Africa is renowned. His engagement with social issues and promotion of the concept of democracy through the course of his career is testimony of his service to the South African society. Now, this year will mark the 11th annual lecture since the official launch of the Frederick Van Sale Slabbert Institute in March of 2011 at Stellenbosch University. Now, we have had a number of distinguished guest speakers over the last decade, names which include <clears throat> Advocate uh, Shimila Batoy, Judge Dennis Davis, Ms. Uh, Mariam Tam, Ms. Wendy Lohabe, Ms. Judith February, Dr. Eindhoven, Mr. Isaac Shongwe, Mr. J. Naidu, <clears throat> Ms. Roma, uh, Maria Ramos and Mr. Harold Parkendorf. So really distinguished list uh, AG that you're going to be adding to uh, for this particular lecture. Now this year's honorary lecture, as has been mentioned, will be delivered by South Africa's Auditor General, uh, Ms. Maluleke. Now Dr. Slabbert's legacy will continue to be relevant where, wherever a thriving democracy is the end goal regardless of how old, new, or fragile that democracy is. Now, his legacy is rooted in his dedication to democratic principles and the advancement of a just and inclusive society. In a young democracy like South Africa's, where the challenges of building a stable and equitable political system still persists, his commitment to democratic values serves as a guiding light for leaders and citizens alike. His adherence to democratic values, ethical leadership, and inclusive values are still very much relevant today. Now, arriving at the University of Stellenbosch to study in the 1960s, uh, Dr. Slabbert was no normal white middle-class student. As per historian Albert uh, Grundlitz's biography, Dr. Slabbert had already worked for a period in Johannesburg, had participated in a, in, a, in a communist discussion group, and had listened to the ideas of PAC founder Robert Suburkwe. He was engaged as a citizen from a young age. His quest for knowledge of relating to people who felt like outsiders cleared the way for his future career. And this thirst for education and truth is something we should aim to instill in our students today. 
He underscored ethical leadership, inclusive dialogues, and youth empowerment. Now coming to Stellenbosch University. <clears throat> For a long time, Stellenbosch University's legacy was intertwined with its history as an institution that contributed towards the injustices of the past. In our restitution statement, we acknowledge that, but we must move and we are moving beyond that. Stellenbosch University's role as a higher education institution is multifaceted. It involves navigating this complex historical legacy, educating graduates with a sense of agency and responsibility, and preparing them to be active contributors to both the South African society and the global community. We recognize that our graduates are part of both the local South African community and the broader global context. We seek to cultivate in our students a sense of citizenship that goes beyond national borders. This includes fostering an understanding of global challenges such as climate change, inequality, and cultural diversity. We know we are preparing graduates who are not only being equipped for academic knowledge, but are also conscious of their role as agents of change. So we should aim to foster a sense of agency and social responsibility in our students. This involves instilling values of ethical leadership, social justice, and inclusivity. And we've had a number of processes at this institution in this regard, the most recent of which is Kerkor and the other transformation initiatives that we are running within the institution at the moment. And SU is engaging with staff, students, and experts on how to best establish and reestablish these qualities that we want to see in our students and graduates. We are actively working towards a transformative student experience for Stellenbosch University graduates not simply from an academic sense, but in terms of their holistic transformation into the citizens this country needs that are able to add value to society by their role and their service. I have been impressed at how our leadership structures, especially our student leadership structures, are engaging on issues like accountability, constitutionalism, and transformation. This development of student leaders and the transformative student experience happens because of an intentional and a deliberate effort to yield those results. And I have to say that the Frederick von Sales Slabbert Institute plays a significant role in the development and in developing the caliber of student leaders, graduates, and critically engaged citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention, and AG, we look forward to your thoughts on how we can advance society as per the spirit and the legacy of the late Dr. Frederick von Sales Slabbert. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor um, Daresh, and I yeah, also just want to thank you for the constant reminder of holding ourselves accountable for our contribution towards that exactly citizen leadership through the work um, of the Frederick von Selslavert Institute. So great appreciation for your support. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the highlight of this evening, our honorary lecture delivered by Ms. Sakani Maluleken. In celebration of Women's Month, I would like to start by mentioning that Ms. Maluleke is the first woman to hold the position of Auditor General in the Supreme Audit Institution's 109th year history. Ms. Maluleke, I hear that, <laughs> so I'll pause. <laughs> Ms. Maluleke is a fellow and moderator of the African Leadership Initiative and the Aspen Global Leadership Network. Her background as a chartered accountant spans more than 20 years with experience in both the private and public sectors in areas as diverse as auditing, consulting, corporate advisory services, development finance, 
investment management and skills development. As a member of the Presidential Black Economic Empowerment Advisory Council, she successfully led a subcommittee that developed recommendations for broad-based black economic empowerment. As chairperson of the Charter Council, she led the first BEE sector charter to be gazetted. This charter focused on key transformation initiatives that improved access to the profession for black people. As a non-executive member of the Financial Advisory and Intermedia um, Services Ombuds Committee, she also advised um, in the setting up of that institution's Ombud Office. Ms. Maluleke's career is motivated by a passion to actively contribute to advancing black people in the accountancy profession. She has pursued this passion through her work with various organizations, including Business Unity South Africa, African Women Chartered Accountants, and the Association for the Advancement of Black Accountants of Southern Africa, of which she is also the past president. Her role as the former non-executive chairperson of the board of SICA was a continuation of this work. A commitment to service excellence and ethical leadership, a recurring theme so far this evening, and her contribution to transformation have been recognized and awarded by the presidents of ABASA, um, the um, African Women Chartered Accountants, and also the Black Management Forum. I now welcome Ms. Sakani Maleleke to present the 11th Frederick Van Sel Henri Lecture. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Heidi October, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'd like to greet uh, the distinguished guests that are amongst us, starting with the Vice Chancellor, Prof. Vim de Villiers. Um, I'd like to greet Prof. Duresh, um, and thank you for your remarks earlier on. And I would like to also recognize the presence of the family of, doctor, the, of the late Dr. Frederick Francis Slabert. I believe Tanya Slabert is online. Uh, members of the academic community, um, distinguished guests, alumni of the university, and current students and staff. Uh, I must say that I am uh, accompanied by members of Team AGSA, the phenomenal, ph phenomenal, phenomenal team that I am uh, pleased to lead uh, at the office of the AG. I'm also accompanied by Naledi, as Prof. De Villiers said, who's my daughter. Uh, we're on school holidays, so this is the one day I was able to negotiate successfully. <laughs> Um, and I'm also accompanied by my sister, Basani, who has made Stellenbosch her home uh, in the last couple of years. So this is starting to feel like home for, for me as well. Uh, so good evening to all of you. I really am delighted to form part of this celebration in honor of the late Dr. Frederick Fanseo Slabert, uh, an academic politician, anti-apartheid activist. And I understand that he earned his PhD here and was also um, uh, by, uh, the chancellor at this university. And because of his extraordinary accomplishments, it is fitting that we honor him in this way. To the Slabbert family, as many of the distinguished um, uh, members of society that have um, granted this lecture before me uh, have done, I want to also add my word of warm gratitude, um, humble gratitude for lending the country um, this fine gentleman uh, for his com contribution to the country, to um, the academic community and to the business world. Today we honor him because of his, the journey that he traveled and the contribution that he made to this country. I am truly, truly privileged to be amongst the distinguished members of society that have um, taken this podium to deliver this lecture before me. Uh, Program Director, coming back to the topic of today. I want to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to engage on this very important subject, which should be and most likely is uh, at the very top of mind for all South Africans. At the AGSA, which is the Auditor General of South Africa, we are constantly seized with this topic, not just because we're one of the institutions that's here to support democracy, 
but because we also believe that we have to keep testing ourselves, testing our assumptions, making sure that we also respond to a changing, a fast-changing world, um, a fast-changing South Africa, and, and check our relevance in terms of how we deal with, with the expectations that society has of us. I, I, I believe that we have to constantly remind ourselves that the reason for our own existence as AGSA is to find ways to, to drive change so that democracy, the experience of democracy, is a reality for all our citizens in their everyday lives. In other words, I believe that there should be a positive impact from the work that we do in delivering a democracy that South Africans enjoy. As you may be aware, our office is one of the Chapter 9 institutions, a construct of the Constitution. Uh, we're one of the six independent state institutions that are mentioned in that chapter. And our job is to support and to de deepen our country's democracy. And as such, we are, I must admit, um, proudly that we are subject only to the Constitution and the law. And that's a key part of our independence, which is a theme I'll come back to just now. Our specific mandate is to strengthen democracy by enabling oversight, accountability, and governance in, in public institutions. And we do this by auditing. Yes, auditing does that. And we do this by auditing and reporting. And we want to do this in a way that does support those very important pillars and values of our democracy. We audit all state institutions, uh, departments, public entities, municipalities, across all the different spheres of government. We audit them every single year. And ultimately, our job is to contribute to securing the well-being of the people of South Africa. Our constitutional mandate, we believe, goes beyond mere number crunching. And I hope there are some aspiring accountants and auditors in the room who will hear this and take it to heart, because I believe that this applies not just to the people at the AGSA, but to all auditors and accountants, but especially in our world. We're quite clear that auditing and accounting as professionals for us is not just about merely number crunching and proffering an opinion. In many ways, that's the easy part. That's the part that I think universities have also mastered how to teach. Uh, you can teach accounting and auditing, auditing standards, but teaching and training a professional that understands the breadth of their responsibility to society, that's what I believe will make universities stand as key contributors to better societies across the world. Our constitution confers on us the legal status of our country's supreme audit institution. Supreme audit institution, we normally say SAI or SAI, so often you hear me refer to this, so that's what I mean when I say SAI. And the Constitution calls on us to operate as independent assurance providers on the state of public finances, whilst, as I said, contributing to democracy. Our Public Audit Act, which is the enabling legislation for the office of the AG, in Section 20 specifically instructs the AG to audit in three key areas. And I'm going to mention them, and that's quite important. The first, first one, it says, AG, go and tell us whether or not the financial statements of the people you are auditing are credible. That's the debits and credits. In many ways, should be the easy part, right? Tell us if the service delivery information is credible. Now, that's the, what we've called performance information or performance reports. Sim simple terms, tell us if what the state institution that you're auditing tells us they've done with the money given to them is reliable. Tell us if that information is true, okay? The third thing, tell us if in the course of applying public funds, that state institution has operated within the rule of law. Those three areas that we audit on, read together, give you a good sense of what's happening in that institution, right? Tells you where's the money gone, to what end, and have the rules been applied? And those are all very important things. And then the, section, the, the same section goes on to add a few other things. It says, Whilst you do this, AG, also include in your audit report some sense of the state of internal controls in that environment. Tell us how things are running in terms of how that institution is being managed. And also, tell us if you've seen things there that require you to apply your additional powers. I think you're well aware that we've been given additional powers with effect from 2019, and those powers give us the right, the authority, the responsibility 
to ensure that there is follow-up on the recommendations that we've issued. So those five things read together give you a full sense of the state of that public institution. And if we do our job right, we'll stop not just at offering an opinion on those five things or giving a report on those five things. We will be seized with making a contribution to improving how that institution runs. And that's basically how we've understood our mandate, and that's how Team AGSA is engaging with its work. Those first three areas, financial statements, performance information, and compliance, when uh, they are put together, that's what we normally talk about as a clean audit. You've heard us talk about that, right? So that's what it is, it's a clean audit. Um, when I walked into this office for, for this function, I bumped into members of Team AGSA. And maybe a bit of context, quite often, People ask us, AG, what's the link between your clean audits and service delivery? Others are less than kind. They'll say, hmm, you know, our people can't eat clean audits. Why must we worry about clean audits? Hmm, what is the big deal about a clean audit anyway? It doesn't tell you that things are perfect. And then we often have pains to try and close the gap. And we're doing pretty well in that regard to make sure that our work does ring true and we close the gap. And it's not yet perfect, but I'm sure you'll agree that we're making moves in the right direction. But let me tell you an anecdote that, that one of my colleagues told me as I walked in today. They said, hmm, we've just spent the day here in Stellenbosch. And now we can see a clean audit. We can see it. And I said, what do you mean? They said, oh, the streets are clean. I was like, oh, actually, this is true. I've been noticing this because I've been here a few days now. Then they said, the municipal building is clean and in good order. It is painted white and it still looks white. <laughs> <laughs> and we're seeing that it is being renovated as things stand. The roads are in good order. Now, does this tell us, does this tell us that everything is hunky-dory in Stellenbosch for every single citizen in Stellenbosch? No. But it tells you that the very basics that are necessary to make sure that life does get better for every citizen, those basics are in place. If you get those basics in place, it does give you a phenomenal platform from which you can now engage on how do you make sure that every single citizen, every single resident of Stellenbosch throughout its entire demarcated area benefits from democracy. Now, if you don't have those basics in place, it becomes ever more difficult to even have that conversation about how do you include people who are not currently enjoying the fruits of our democracy. The work we do um, is work that other size supreme audit institutions also do across the world. And we converse regularly with our global peers. And one of the things that is quite telling is that our Section 20, which requires of us to audit those five areas as I spoke about, is consistent with best practice elsewhere. INTOSAI, which is the International Organization for Supreme Audit Institutions, affirms that public sector auditing, as championed by size, is an important factor in strengthening the systems of performance, transparency, accountability, and integrity of public institutions, and thus strengthening democracy and ultimately making a difference in the lives of citizens. The organization declares that once a size audit results have been made public, as we do, citizens are able to hold custodians of public resources accountable. In this way, size promote the efficiency, accountability, effectiveness, and transparency of public administration. They say that an independent, effective, and credible size is therefore an essential component in a democratic system where accountability, transparency, and integrity are indispensable parts of a stable democracy. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why at the AGSA, we believe that our job is to go beyond just the numbers and to be seized with the experience of human beings because we know that citizens of this country depend on institutions like ours to promote good governance to the extent possible. Therefore, it's important that we strive to respond to what citizens want and to make our work ever more relevant to their daily lives. 
And we do this while ferociously guarding our independence. And I made mention this lightly earlier on, just to highlight the point. Supreme audit institutions, in order to be effective, must be independent. And there are particular pillars that, that are part of a set of aspirations of how best an, uh, a supreme audit institution can place itself as an independent and credible player. And just about a year ago, the World Bank assessed no less than 118 countries against that aspirational set of principles. And they checked independently which countries enjoy full independence. And our country, AGSA, the Psi of South Africa, was rated as one of only two countries that enjoys full marks for independence. Now that's a great credit to our institution, our constitution, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, I think that does deserve applause for the people of AGSA, but importantly for the people of South Africa. It talks to our constitution. It talks to our legislation. It talks to our legislators, our parliament, our government, the people of South Africa who make it their business to maintain a credible and effective and independent side. Now, if you're ever looking for some good news to inspire you about why it's worthwhile to protect the values of our constitution and how it is possible for that to be done and the value of doing it, if you're ever looking for those good news, I give you permission. <laughs> Visit the AGSA. Visit the team members of the AGSA. Spend some time with our young people. We have 1,200 of them who are graduates who come from universities such as yours, and they join us and they, they form part of our training program and the, with, the, with the journey of being one day uh, chartered accountants. And our training program is the biggest training program that has been accredited by the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants. And every year now, we are in the either second spot or third spot of delivering the highest number of new CAs. Let me make the point differently so that it lands. <laughs> you know how we often think that public sector plays second fiddle to the private sector? And the lecturers, I hope some of them from the School of Accountancy are here, don't really understand public finances. They don't really engage with the work of, of, of what happens in the public sector. The content of the curriculum isn't really well placed to engage with it. Guess what's happening at the office of the AG? Over the last 20 years or so, and we started small, we've been building the scheme. And now it ranks Last year, it ranked second only to one of the big four in terms of the number of CAs that qualified through the AGSA, a public sector institution delivered no less than 309 new CAs last year, 250 in the, this year, good 500 in the last couple of years, 1,800 over the last 20 years. The majority black, the majority women. <clears throat> So that was just a, a sideshow to, to, to invite you to visit us and to inspire the young people about what happens at the AGSA. Um, and hopefully that, that uh, gives you another option that you might not have thought about, about what happens after articles, after, after fourth year. Good governance, distinguished gentlemen and ladies, good governance is the foundation upon which a successful nation is built. It's not nearly a buzzword. It is a commitment to transparency, accountability, and responsible leadership in all seasons, good or bad. It is imperative that our public institutions uphold these values unwaveringly. Transparency ensures that the actions of leaders remain open to scrutiny, paving the way to trust and confidence for their decisions. Accountability ensures that those appointed as stewards of public sector institutions are answerable for their actions, creating a system where wrongdoing finds no refuge. Sadly, our nation's history has shown us the dire consequences of poor governance. 
it is our responsibility to learn from those lessons and to ensure that our public institutions going forward are fortified against any transgressions by, by those inside those institutions as well as those outside of those institutions. To put it more clearly, it's our responsibility to make sure that those who interact with public sector institutions whilst they sit in the private sector or elsewhere in our society, similarly, remember their responsibility as citizens to safeguard the credibility of our public institutions. If each of us adheres to ethical values and maintains an unwavering commitment to bettering the lives of citizens that we are all meant to serve, we can establish a culture of good governance. There are a number of challenges that face our country, this we know, and we often find ourselves confronted by other frustration or helplessness. Far too many resources and funds do not go towards their intended purpose, which exposes citizens to tremendous hardship. Roads and other infrastructure are not maintained properly and citizens are harmed by inadequate access to quality health care. They are harmed by unpredictable access to clean water as well as increasingly polluted environments. More than a year after the devastating floods in KZN and the Eastern Cape, the residents of the affected municipalities still find themselves in shelters that deny them the dignity that they so deserve. We've seen a number of public pr protests rise as citizens demand not just better services, but access to basic services such as clean running water, healthcare, power, as well as support in times of hardship. In this context, <clears throat> I did wonder if the words of Dr. Fancel Slabert as quoted in his biography were a prediction, and if this prediction has indeed come true. He said that when I look towards the future, I'm fearful of the long darkness that may await us all. I'm saddened by the human potential that we have squandered. But here in South Africa, we have problems to solve, for which the rest of the world has found no solutions. That in itself is a great challenge. Far more disturbing are the expectations that people have of what a democracy can deliver, and which research shows it is incapable of doing. This, in the South African context, is the real burden of democracy. Predictions are not an exact science, and they're fraught with danger, <laughs> because, especially if they're negative predictions, they do cause panic, they do cause people to um, get into a chaotic space. But predictions can also be good. They are warnings about our future. And as life has taught us, hindsight judges the usefulness of our predictions. It seems now, with the benefit of hindsight, that his fear was not unfounded. While we are confronted by the reality that Fancel Slabet described, I believe that we can also draw courage from that one sentence where he says, but here in South Africa, we have problems to solve for which the rest of the world has found no solution. If ever there was a challenge and inspiration for us, let it be that. I believe that South Africans, with our shared and pressing challenges, are well poised to find the solutions that the world seeks. As Team AGSA, we've embraced the challenge and have designed our organizational strategy so that we make our own contribution to finding those solutions. The auditing and reporting work that we do examines the numbers, the compliance, the, and reconciles them to the performance on the ground as I've indicated. And then we publish this in reports that are then used for accountability purposes. I'd like to focus your attention on one part of our audits, which is that of the audit of performance information. Because quite often, the debits and credits are easy to relate to. The compliance one, everyone talks about irregular expenditure, everyone gets depressed for a while, and then we kind of all move on. <laughs> so just for a few minutes, I'd like to just chat about the one on performance information, one that all too often gets ignored. Because <clears throat> when a public institution gets an unqualified opinion on their financial statements, they 
have reason to celebrate, right? They'll say, no, no, we have an unqualified opinion. And then many of them will even go as far as to say, no, now leave us alone, you know, forget about everything else, right? And then as South Africans, we tend to leave well enough alone. We don't engage on the other story that comes from the audit office. So with your indulgence, I'd just like us to think about what do we do to get everyone more engaged on this story of this service delivery report? Because what is it in simple terms? At the beginning of the performance year, there's an allocation of funds, public funds, meant to do specific things. And then those are put into what is called an annual performance plan. And once the money's been spent, somebody's supposed to now say, what have they done or achieved against the annual performance plan, right? Yes, the debits and credits are done, but what have you done against the annual performance plan? And if you, year after year, are unable to produce an annual performance report of any credibility, what does that say about you as a leader in terms of your own commitment to transparency and accountability? I believe that this is the space we all should be more engaged in and with. Our failure to do that as citizens leaves us much poorer for it. And in fact, the failure of those that lead public institutions to engage with this topic leaves us all much, much poorer. As the audit office, we've decided to place much more emphasis on this part of our mandate. We've been doing this work for many years and with the diligence that you would expect from us. But we've understood that this environment now, where the needs and wants of citizens are growing every year, and yet, on the other hand, the fiscal resources are diminishing every single year. This moment calls for us to change the conversation beyond debits and credits, beyond irregular expenditure, to really engage what is happening with the funds we do have available. How do we start to shift this culture from saying, let's just comply with the rules of the AG, but really do nothing in between? How do we shift this culture to one that says, yes, you must comply, but guess what, you must also perform. If we read section 195 of the Constitution, very clear. You don't get to opt out. You have to be transparent, you must be accountable, and you must be efficient. You have to perform. When we read it, you don't, have to, you, you don't get to opt out. And I would like to issue this invitation to all of us as citizens to start engaging more and more around this topic of performance information, to look more carefully. When a municipality doesn't report faithfully on what they've done with public funds, that's when you know that they've not performed on mandate. The difference between an institution that is delivering on mandate, I believe, sits in that performance information. Some of the things we are seeing as we go about deepening the work we're doing as the audit office in this area is that some institutions get away with very strange performance plans, very strange ones. They'll say, yes, my mandate is to support municipalities, let's just say if I'm a provincial cocktail, right? If you look at the law, it's very clear. My mandate, as, a, as the leader of the provincial cocktail, the mandate is to support and, and, and monitor municipalities. And then you look closely at the performance plan, and what is there? Five meetings with municipalities. Tick, right? <laughs> Two workshops. Tick, right? And then we all wonder why the resources that are being placed in that institution are not having the impact we desire. Now, I'm not suggesting that every single public sector leader, leader is failing at this, nor am I suggesting that the framework that's available is perfect. I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm also mindful that there is a lot of work we all have to do around how do we shape the conversation around planning for outcomes and impact and measuring as we go along. But what I know for sure, we cannot stay at the space of measuring the number of meetings and ticking and moving on. The conversation must shift. The culture must shift. And it is about time that all of us as institutions, as leaders, and as citizens, we demand that that conversation shifts 
it's also time that we engage in a very difficult and different conversation amongst ourselves. When we audit, we find that institutions that have got clean audits are those where the leaders engage in the story of performance information, genuinely. Does it say that the environment is perfect? No, but they engage with it. And they work towards improving the quality of it because they appreciate how the ability to plan for performance and report on performance helps them manage the performance of the people they lead and also helps them manage the projects that they say they're going to enter into. Municipalities that do better with performance information are those where in their five-year development plan, they are clear about what's going to happen every single year. They are clear about the funding resources they're going, to, they're going to be able to access, and then they measure how they're growing every single year. They are the ones that have fewer problems with projects. And the ones on the other side of the scale, the ones where money gets put into their coffers and gets spent on something other than what it's intended for, or it gets sent back to the national fiscus at the end of the year, they are the ones that don't do well in planning for performance, let alone monitoring and reporting faithfully on it. Institutions that perform on their given functions, let's say you're a municipality and you're supposed to offer um, the quality sanitation services, if you don't even have that in your performance plan, One's got to wonder about what level of attention as the leader of the institution you're placing in that function. And then we wonder why that service isn't available to citizens at the quality we deserve. So, to reiterate, it is time we change the conversation amongst ourselves. I wanted to reflect a little bit on um, that Roy Val story. Um, in one of the conversations we had with the office, um, it was quite topical, I suppose, at the time that uh, we were starting to plan for this event. Sadly, you remember that uh, there was a cholera outbreak in the Hamasqua area just outside of Pretoria. Um, and having been raised in the Pretoria area um, in a township called Soshanguve, Ham Hamasqua is not too far from my heart, right? Um, as the audit office, we had been reporting on concerns around the quality and the state of the wastewater treatment plant um, at Royval. And we had raised audit findings and given recommendations on how that plant ought to be, um, to be fixed. Um, and we also raised um, insights around the impact on the water quality being given to residents of Hamanskral um, arising from this dysfunctional wastewater treatment plant. Our findings and recommendations were very similar to what the South African Human Rights Commission had also issued, having done the work. And there was very little traction in terms of implementing those recommendations by the people leading the institution. And sadly, people lost their lives. For us as the audit office, it was a moment of, yes, sadness that it had come to this, true disappointment, but also reflection on how we could also get better at influencing swifter action on things that we've identified. But I believe for all of us as South Africans, be us in government or outside of government, the lesson is, let's make sure that we are seized with insisting that our public institutions are run by people of competence, professionals of good ethical posture, individuals who are responsive, and individuals who are responsible. There can be no other solution to redeeming the state of public management across the country than that. And I know it's not a quick fix. But fortunately, Cabinet has signed off a professionalization framework. What we should all be worried about is how it is being implemented. 
it must be implemented right across the public service because the only way we're going to get public institutions functioning on their mandate and consistently delivering on the things they're meant to deliver on and being transparent and accountable is by making sure that they are led and managed by people who have the skills to do what's required, the ethical posture, and they are responsive to citizens' needs, and they are responsible with the funds that have been given to them. They operate as stewards of those funds, of those institutions, as well as stewards of the hopes and aspirations of citizens. That, in my view, is the very thing that we should all be advocating for. Um, I'm aware of the time. I have veered a little bit as I bragged about AGSA, so I'm going to, <laughs> as I'm prone to do. Um, maybe let me just <clears throat> talk about what I think is the call for citizenship in this moment. I've talked at great length about the need for us to engage in a different conversation around how public institutions run to engage differently with the work of the Office of the AG and other reports. I believe that we could take a leaf out of Dr. Fanseil Slabet's own autobiography, his own story, his own journey. One of our finest minds who had opportunities to do anything, private sector, public sector, and yet he chose to opt in to the public service. And the question I would ask each of us is whether we give mind to that in our own lives, when we teach, when we mentor, when we advise young people, do we make the public sector, the public service, civic duty, a central part of our conversations? Or is the conversation still only about, well, get your education, get a good job, and probably get out of the country? Nine years ago, you heard from, I think it was eight years ago, you heard from Isaac Shongwe. And he was at pains to talk to you at this lecture about the need for courage the need for the privileged amongst us to opt in, the need for us to get into the arena. Nine years ago, he was lamenting about how the country uh, was on the ground fighting for, its, fighting for air, I think he, he said. Today, conversations about our country range from debates on whether or not it is failing or has failed. Whatever your answer to that question is, I just think it has never been more urgent for us to hearken to the call that Isaac issued to each of us. Those who are privileged to have education, to have opportunities, to have talent, to have skills, the question is, are we continually opting out, or are we mindful of the responsibility we have to opt in? The second thing I would say about citizenship is that as professionals, we get to operate in different parts of society. And whether or not we opt into the public service for the long haul or for a short time, The question is, how do we engage with our work around the public sector? One of the things I will never, ever, ever let go, I think it, it sort of has stuck with me um, throughout my 11 years in the audit office. It is that municipalities spend money on consultants to help them compile financial statements. One might wonder about why do municipalities do this? And there's a whole host of reasons. What I worry about is about those professionals doing the work because they help them put financials together. The bill last year was 1.6 billion, yeah? 
we've been tracking it, by the way. When I started tracking it, it was 100 million rand. That was 10 years ago. The consolidated bill, just for the debits and credits, mind you, 1.6 billion rand, okay? One's got to ask yourself, who are these consultants? Who trained them? What posture did they leave their universities with? What communities do they live in and thrive in? What part of society celebrates their success when this is what they do? In a narrow sense, one could say, well, they're offering a service and they're, they're getting their, what do they call Get the bag, they're getting their bag, they say. <laughs> the young people know. <laughs> If, as citizens, we do not embrace our duty to interact differently with the public sector, we will continue to see a weakening of capacity in public institutions, and then we all lose. You see, not all of us can live in Stellenbosch. You see, a successful few towns in the country does not a successful and prosperous society of South Africa make. So as citizens, we've got to engage with what does it mean for us? And of course there are other things. Let's engage with the IDPs of municipalities, their development plans. Let's engage with conversations about budgets. Let's engage with the story around who actually leads our universities, who leads our institutions, who leads any public institution. Let's be seized with that. And sure, it's very easy to trivialize one or two um, public leaders that falls by the wayside. My sense, our job as citizens is to ensure that we start to create a public sector that is populated by the very best of us and a public sector from which we demand the very best. If you don't worry about how you populate that institution and how you interact with it, you really have little leg to stand on in demanding the best of that institution. If you're part of those who extract from the public sector and never engage fairly with the public sector, if you're part of those who exploit weaknesses in the public sector and you never deliver quality work as a professional, then you really should be the very last one to complain about an exploding road in a municipality. And perhaps the last thing I would offer as a word to citizens is to remember that the public sector is populated by many public servants that want to do good and in many ways try hard. They work hard every single day and they try to do good. So when we complain, let's remember that there are compatriots of ours who are working extremely hard to try and make the system work for us. Let's also remember that Protecting institutions is the only way we're going to sustain improvements and to ultimately deliver a better life for all. I listened to, and I'm now going to, to conclude. Um, I, I listened to the lecture given by Jay Naidu. And in it, he was at pains to say that, let's remember that we shouldn't be looking for heroes. It's all up to us. So as I conclude, I want to assert that when I talk about citizens, I'm talking about you and I as individuals. I want to remind you that Jay Naidu encouraged us all to actively demand performance, transparency, and accountability in government. And he cautioned us against looking elsewhere other than ourselves. And he was at pains to say that our individual and collective responsibility as citizens cannot be ignored. So my compatriots, the road to a stronger South Africa lies in the nexus of good governance and good citizenship. 
Together, we can forge a path that ensures that we uphold the values of transparency, accountability, and respect for the rule of law, and all whilst realizing our ambitions, our noble ambitions, of building a democracy that delivers a better and more dignified life for all. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks, AG. I always wanted to say that. Thanks, AG. <laughs> I think after that resounding um, conversation around sense making and where we are, I'm rest assured about two things. One, all of us here and online are now firmly, we're all Team AGSA. <laughs> and secondly, one of the things that I'll have to do when I get home is download my Watts service delivery and budget Im implementation plan to see what is happening in terms of that particular aspect. Colleagues, we now move into the other part of our conversation where the, there will be a moderated conversation between the AG and Ms. Rabia, um, uh, no, Rabia Abba Oma, who is the, uh, uh, who is the, the citizenship, uh, citizenship Engagement Coordinator at the Fergie van Slavert Institute. Rabs, over to you. Sure, thank you very much for that. I echo what Yeki said, that was an incredible, incredible speech. And I, yeah, we are all Team AGSA now. <laughs> We've got many fans that have been added on. Um, thank you so much for your comments in your lecture tonight. Um, I wanna touch a little bit on your work, maybe, if we can start there. So, in 2019, the scope of your powers was expanded to include material irregularities, um, and that is where you can refer material irre irregularities to the relevant public bodies to investigate those. Um, and how does this expansion and your ability now um, to start the process on investigating these strengthen your ability to audit and enforce accountability within our public institutions at a municipal level and also a national level? No, thanks for that question, and, and thank you for your very kind compliment. Um, the, the powers that we have are essentially a complementary instrument to enforce accountability. Quite often people will say, hey, gee, you've got these new powers, you've got teeth, let's see you bite. They'll say, uh, put people in jail. They'll say, let's see the powers work. And, um, and perhaps with good reason, because South Africans are hungry to see consequences for wrongdoing. These powers are there to help us make a contribution. It's important for me to frame that our role remains that of an independent auditor. We're not law enforcement, and neither should we be. I'm not sure you want auditors walking around, <laughs> walking around with handcuffs. Um, we're also not specialized investigators. At the end of the audit, what we can say is there is a problem. And we give that information to the people leading the institution. And we say, go and investigate, right? Um, and then if they do that, that's all well and good because they are the people appointed um, and given the authority to run that, that institution and to act on our recommendations. So let's say in a perfect world, we never have to use those powers. All you do is say, okay, this one of the 400 recommendations we've given, this one is the one you want to worry about. You see, Roy Val, that's where you must focus. And we'll say that, right? Or we'll say, uh, we've identified um, an area where you're losing money. It looks like fraud. Go and deal with that urgently. You know, you can sort out something else later on. And if they do it, that's for well and good. If they don't, then we're supposed to refer the matter for investigation because you need an investigation to tell you who did what, what, the all, what all the facts are, right? Once an inv investigation is done, we can then say to that uh, accounting officer, the investigation has been done, uh, we helped you, now can you help yourself and actually do the required, which is to report matters to law enforcement, to dis discipline staff that did wrong, to recover funds, to cancel contracts, and if they do that, also fine. The problem is when they don't do it. Then we have the power to issue remedial action. 
binding remedial action which can only be reviewed in a court of law. So that's now much more serious because now they have to do what we're, doing, we're saying. Um, and if they fail to do that, we give them an opportunity. If they fail again, then we issue a certificate of debt in their name and that's when it hits the pocket. We've been able to use these powers to pretty good effect because our posture has been about how do we get accounting officers to become more responsive? And we've seen that, right? We've seen that when we issue these MIs, perhaps with the threat of a certificate of debt later on or a spotlight that says now I have this material irregularity, they are now responding, uh, which is a good thing. What we hope for and what we should all insist on is that accounting officers, that's now your municipal manager, your HOD, your DG, they must now start to respond on other problems we raise, not just MIs. Because clearly they have the ability to respond. We should insist that they do. Um, what we're also seeing is that uh, we, we are now able to refer matters to law enforcement to follow through. Um, I read with pride just the other day that a matter we had referred to the Hawks back in 2021 um, around a, an infrastructure project gone wrong in Machabeng in the Free State, uh, the Hawks had now arrested somebody. It's taken a while um, because these things do take time, right? But at least it's happening. Um, and also there, there's a municipality in the Northwest where we're getting towards issuing a certificate of debt. The short answer is these instru this instrument is worthwhile in that it helps us start to shift the conversation with accounting officers, but it cannot be the be all and end all of solving our problems with accountability. What must change, I'd say, are three things. One is the culture in institutions. They must follow through on things that go wrong. Because in a normal world where there's operations, something will go wrong invariably. The question is how quickly do you respond? Two, when they fail to respond, they must be held accountable. Once you've got the AG issuing remedial action and a certificate of debt, you've got to ask yourself, where is the person actually supervising that accounting officer? Because it's not the AG. So why are you waiting for the AG to come and do that which the person that reports to you is not doing. That's, that's you know, so, so we've got to shift that. And perhaps a third one is um, to capacitate the public bodies charged with law enforcement in particular. Um, there, there are far too many instances where it becomes quite evident that there are capacity gaps um, that need to be filled if we are to get much more traction in, in dealing with consequences. Maybe just to elaborate one more, just to give you, I won't leave you with, 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 without saying this, that in the middle of COVID, and of course there was tremendous leakage in COVID, there were also good things that were done in COVID. There was, sometimes you forget that, right? Sometimes you forget that. Government put together a tremendous relief package and they implemented much of it, and much of it well. And yes, the scandals around what happened with PPE um, are distressing. But you know something we also forget? is that the same government also put together the Fusion Center, which was a collective of the investigations bodies and the law enforcement bodies. And when we finished auditing, because we audited quickly, we still audited after the fact, but we audited quickly. So we called it a real-time audit. And then we were able to give our findings and data to that Fusion Center. And the component parts of that Fusion Center took the work forward. So before six months was done, there were people in the dock. People were arrested, uh, the cars were being repossessed, money was being protected. Um, so we've been able to see that these things are possible. So we must just insist that there's more of it and that there's capacity put in the right places to ensure that that becomes the norm rather than the exception. Thank you. This evening you spoke to us and you mentioned two instances. So you mentioned the Royval. Um, wastewater treatment facility, and you also um, spoke about the flooding that happened in KZN last year. And so my question for you is, how does a lack of uh, accountability threaten our constitutional principles in times of crisis? And how does, those, how does that threat, um, and then these threats on our constitutional principles, affect everyday people? You know, in the middle of a crisis, um, there's got to be an ability to act quickly, right? Naturally. And when there is inadequate capacity in an institution, 
They can't plan, implement, and record what they're doing so that they can account later on. They just don't have those practices. So things take that much longer. Look at the, fund, the, the flood relief one. There just wasn't enough capacity in municipalities to assess the damage, to design their interventions, to cost them, and to use that information to credibly apply to use the funding that was available. So citizens then sat and said, we hear there's money available. Why are we not getting the relief? The gap is capability of the public institutions, and that's what we have to fix. And without that capability, you're not going to be able to get the responsiveness you need. Maybe the second thing is, when there isn't enough trust in a system, um, people then rely on dotting every single I and crossing every single T laboriously before they do things. So we've got to mature to a point where there is a core of competent administrators in government who enjoy the trust of citizens on the one hand, but also of their political principles. And then you start to see how things can move quickly. Um, what we've seen is institutions that do well in a crisis are those where there's strong, stable leadership and trust between the political level and the administration, and two, where they have predictable systems for doing things. Then they're able to get the, the relief packages done quickly. Thank you, and I, I think that also touches so strongly as well with COVID and the, and the effects that we've seen. Um, you've mentioned just now and, and also earlier this evening about the importance of the professionalization of the, um, of the public service and of local government in South Africa and how that builds a, a culture of capability and competence um, and then that how that can improve service delivery. So what are, um, what's your sort of message to young people, to the students at Stellenbosch University and beyond um, and how to step up to the challenge of being part of the profession professionalization of the public service. You know, I would invite young people to kind of frame their own thinking slightly differently, their own thinking about their careers slightly differently. Um, first of all, embrace this idea that you too have a responsibility to society. You're part of a privileged class. None of us get through to first degree, second degree, third degree, as some of you end up doing, without tremendous investment by society in you. And that presents you with great opportunities, but also with a wonderful opportunity to, to reinvest. You could call it a burden. I deliberately call it an opportunity to reinvest, a responsibility. Um, that's what I would say to young people. And having done that, having made that decision about let me look for an opportunity to go and serve, think carefully about where you go and serve. Uh, and here I'm being pragmatic. Not all public institutions enjoy strong, competent, capable, capable stable leadership that instills a culture, an internal culture that embraces strong technical skills, that nurtures talent. They are there, and happy to name them if you'd like, but all I will say to you is choose wisely, because the last thing you want is to end up in an environment where you yourself are not going to grow, you are not going to enjoy the work you do, and you're not going to be able to move forward with your career quickly. Um, when you find the right environment, and as I say, they are there, I've seen young people sparkle. Um, just the other day, I was talking to somebody who happens to work, and I named this one, who happens to work for the National Treasury, which is a good environment, right? And says, in the Treasury, the great thing is that we're given responsibilities quickly, and we learn quickly about complex things, and we get to have an impact much greater than what we would have if we were working in a private sector institution at this age. The AGSA is in a professional environment that enjoys stable, competent, capable leadership 
that allows for an environment that is professional, an environment where people grow and they go and do wonderful things. The people who leave us, I must break was one more time. The people who leave us go and run public institutions. They go into the private sector. Uh, there's one private sector institution I must go and complain at. They keep recruiting our guys. Like, you know, it's one thing if people recruit one or two, but now every time you meet someone, I'm going there, I'm going like, ah, I think I need to have tea with someone here. <laughs> and then also our global peers, other auditors general, higher from the AGSA, when they decide they're now going to audit local government, they look here. Why? Because they know the skills are here. When they decide they must now audit the intelligence services differently, they look here because they know the skills are here. So in a, the short answer is this. There are a number of public institutions that are wonderful environments for talent. Look for them. And you can even use them as a stepping stone for building your career as you go forward. But do not neglect your civic duty. Do opt in. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. I, yeah, agree, totally. Opt in. It is, as you said, it's an opportunity to reinvest. Um, earlier when you were speaking, I made a note for myself because you said we need transparency, efficiency, and accountability. And I was like, oh, we need tea. <laughs> so I think that's something that's my takeaway from this evening of like, we need tea. Um, so you know that we, as we all know, as we're all very aware, we are in a pre-election phase. Um, and with national elections that are going to be happening next year, you've spoken about the need to strengthen our public institutions so that they can handle political instability. Yeah. Um, and that instability comes with elections. Um, so what role can civil society and the public play in strengthening our ecosystems of accountability in the lead up to the elections? No, thanks for raising that uh, as we stand um, looking towards the next general election. Um, and we're still kind of recovering from the uh, political shifts that happened following the local government elections recently, right? So I think the instruction for all of us is to be seized with um, building stable public institutions. The administration of public institutions must enjoy stability. Um, and we must find a way to insulate it from political events. We, we're an evolving democracy. These things will happen. It's, it's, it's the natural order of how democracies evolve. We might not like it always. Um, there may be things that need to change in terms of how it happens, but happen, it does. These changes do happen. The job I think we must all worry about is, is the, the stability in the administration. And civil society, the posture I would invite should be about that. Um, organizations in civil society, and we're working more and more with them at the AJSA, they've got different themes and sectors that they're worried about, all of them as they build depth in, in this, the, their chosen fields, come to the realize, realization that it all hangs on the competence and leadership posture of the person running the administration. Um, the political leadership does move on. What we must keep fighting for is to find a way to have stability at that level. Wonderful, thank you so much. I'm now going to turn to our audience. Um, because of time, and thank you for indulging me and letting me ask my questions, um, we will do two questions from the floor and then one question from our online audience. Um, and our mics, Holly is, there we go, there's Holly. Cool. Any, yeah, we've got a, two hands over there. And then can you also introduce yourselves, please? Okay, no problem. Thank you very much, Ms. Maluleke. Um, I am also an honest student in accounting, so I will be working next year. Um, <laughs> but yeah, also a Tatuka Bursary Fund recipient, uh, a fund that has similar aspirations to what you have for the profession. Um, and my one question was going to be about the public sector. 
Um, but my next question is about what you've mentioned about performance oriented um, government. Um, and I think what I'd like to ask is, um, what do you think would uh, catalyze that shift um, from not just trying to comply, but specifically trying to perform? And I think um, that goes for the organization as a whole, um, but also particular leaders as well, because you've also mentioned that you need um, competent leadership in positions um, uh, in order for an organization to be stable. So I think from a performance oriented perspective, uh, what do you think would be the catalyst for such a revolution, if I can call it that, um, in the public sector? Yeah. Um, maybe it's because of the last point we, we were dealing with. Um, I think the major catalyst is competent, stable leadership in the administration. And I'll tell you why. The, the things that public institutions deal with tend to be quite complex and they tend to be long-term. The things they have to commit to, whether it's capital projects, whether it's um, other areas of development work, they are long-term. And the outcome is not always um, uh, predictable, right? So you need a leader that understands in depth the space within which they're operating, that is able to craft a set of annual initiatives that are clearly aligned to a longer term vision. Then it's much easier for them to craft an annual performance plan that is aligned to a long term vision and cascade that annual performance plan to the people that they supervise. If that individual doesn't have the competence or the depth of knowledge about the sector that they are running, it's going to be tremendously difficult to do it. Um, the other thing is, if that person doesn't have the expectation that they will have longevity in their role, the ability to sit and think and plan and monitor on an, on a, with a long-range view is, 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 quite, is quite diminished. I would love to say auditors can come save the day but they can't. It has got to be the leaders of the administration. Think about your own life. When you know what you want to do, whether, say you, you, you decided seven years ago or five years ago you wanted to be a CA, let's say. You knew that year one my, of my BCom, I must do this, I must do that, and then there's honors, then there's articles. But if you don't have a sense of this journey that's going to take you there, you sit in one year and you say, I want to be a CA, but then you wonder why nothing happens. Do you see the point? So you've got to have a long range, and you've got to have a sense of stability, of vision, consistency of, of approaches. If I look at the AGSA, one of the things we really benefit from is stability at leadership. Um, two ages ago, um, Terence Nombem, in fact, Shoket Feki at the Dome of Democracy was our AG. He'd been in the institution for a while before then. Um, and then Terence Nombembe was the deputy AG, and then he became the AG. Then Kimi Magwetu was his DAG, and he became the AG. And now as Kimi Magwetu is DAG, I became the AG, right? The institution benefits from that continuous vision. Yes, we're all very different people, but the things that we hold dear tend to be quite common. And so the leadership transitions in our institution are not disruptive. Sure, people have to you know, kind of shift and change, that's life, you know? But the numbers I brag about in terms of the number of CAs we're able to, to, to deliver every year comes out of consistent attention to this scheme by, by Shokit, by Terence, by Kim, me, and by me. And the next AG who comes along will run this thing even better, right? And they'll talk about different things in terms of what they're achieving with it. And that, you know, I'm gonna be excited to celebrate from wherever I am, you know, cause I leave end of November, 2027. That's a certainty, you know. That, one of the great things about the job is that <laughs> there's no mystery about when I'm going, you know? Cause the constitution says I have one non-renewable term. But the, sh the, the real answer to your question, you gotta have competence and you've gotta have longevity. Thank you. Uh, second question. Ooh, sorry, I can't see. Hi. Hi. Hi, Ravia. Um, hi, there. hi, Ms. Sagane. Firstly, um, 
Happy Women's Day to you. Happy Women's Day to all women present today. Um, I truly want to say that you embody what our foremothers wanted. So congratulations also on being the first black woman, of course, to be that. Thank you. Thank you, really. Um, I, we, we are truly inspired. Um, never think that the work you do is not inspiring. I sit here and I am truly inspired. Um, you spoke about something and talking about capacity, um, and that really struck a nerve with me. I'm a politics student, if that didn't come across by my funky hair. <laughs> um, and that was what Prof. Vim asked. He said, what is Stellenbosch memorable for? And I thought and pondered for a minute, because sometimes I am the biggest critic of Stellenbosch, because I know as an institution we can be better. But when you said capacity is what public institutions lack, you made me remember what Stellenbosch is great for. Stellenbosch is great for its capacity. It has great capacity to lead, implement, execute, both in good and in bad times. Um, they act very fast when it comes to being in COVID and when there's a protest about students on the rape plane. So it's a double-edged sword, their capacity. But they have capacity. Right. Hey, prof, I see you. I see you, Prof. <laughs> but um, how do you think, um, as young people and as young women particularly, we can infiltrate um, these spaces that we know how we can design because we are leaders and we are students that come from an institution that has shown us how to execute, how to have this capacity that is lacking in public institutions. However, you know there's a very gray space there. You know, and as someone that has done it yourself, being in a not only male-dominated industry, but a white male-dominated industry, accounting. Trust me, I pass by accounting every morning. I see there's predominantly white men there. <laughs> So how did you do it? And how can we take from your lessons to infiltrate these spaces that we know very deep in our hearts we can change? So, yes. Hey, sure. So, um, you, you, I'm still reading from, from your input, and I'm, I have a lot to think about in terms of what you said. And, and, and Prof, kudos to you for, for leading this institution as you have over choppy waters. Um, my young sister, I would say to you maybe three things. The first one is that I was fortunate to be taught by my parents that never believe that anyone is inherently better than you. Um, I, I grew up under apartheid, right? And um, m there were moments over time when um, the conversation was about, well, at school they said that it's better if the boy comes number one and I come number two. And I would come home and I'd be told, no, that doesn't apply. And there were moments when I'd be told that um, but, but how come you came first in an English comprehension test when you're the only black child in the class? And I would go home and lament about that. I'd be told, no, that does not apply. So do not ever believe that anyone is inherently better than you. And I think that has stood me in good stead. And that's why I dared to become an accountant in a world where there were few <laughs> black female accountants. Perhaps the second thing I would say to you is the value of hard work. You know, you, you say to me now, and I'm going to hold this in my heart, when you say your, your work, we see your work. It inspires us. You know, at the AJSA, we work so hard, so it's wonderful to hear that because we put our heads down and we work hard and often shut out the noise just so we can deliver what we know is our mandate. And I would say to you, do the same. Shut out the noise. Do your work. Put your head down. Work ethic, I believe, will always trump even talent, let alone race or gender. And maybe the last thing I would say to you is build networks of people who think like you, but also expand them to include people who don't think like you, because that's how you will grow. And that's what I would suggest to you. Thank you. That was very, very useful. 
we are special, inspiring, <laughs> necessary. Uh, well, one question that we've got from online, um, we've got a few, but this will be the, um, the question that we'll ask tonight is, should professional bodies, including those that govern chartered accountants, not take a more proactive approach to disciplining private and public sector members who go rogue? Absolutely. <laughs> Short answer, but the good thing is they've actually been doing that. You might know that the constitution of SICA was changed a few years ago, and there have been moves to ensure that the, the work of identifying problems and dealing swiftly with disciplinary action um, gets, gets attention. And we've seen a few people dealt with, um, because it is completely unacceptable that if a few rotten apples spoil this whole thing for all of us. There are many aspiring accountants, and you want them to enjoy um, walking into a profession that's well regarded um, and knowing that their qualification means something to society here, but also it opens doors for them across the world. So that's important. So we have to protect all of that. So I agree we must do more, but I'm, I am inspired and encouraged by what I'm seeing um, SAICA as well as IRBA, which is the regulatory board of auditors do. Thank you. I think we can all agree on another round of applause. So you, 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 you also get caught up and forget that, you know, <laughs> you, you're supposed to be here. So yeah, that's me. Um, we're nearly there. We're nearly there, colleagues. I think um, at this point in time, uh, we've got quickly, um, as part of the entertainment, just to get us moving, not Yeki, um, we've got Mfundi, the poet, uh, who's going to just quickly do a poem or something. So Mfundi, the poet, uh, if he's here, so you maybe just do your thing that is on a family. Greetings to my elders in the house and to my peers. Uh, the poem is titled Broken System. I think it takes no scholar, it doesn't take you to have a qualification to sense that there's something broken about our system. So, hope you find something in it. The nation is bleeding cut from the sharp glasses of a broken system, a system that needs to be humbled into intense revision, for it is cultivating and fertilizing a ground of division. Freedom seems to be the road only for the rich. The poor deems freedom a myth, still a goal they wish to someday reach. The, the brain has become the last thing they desire to enrich. They are too hungry to listen to those who can teach. The nation is divided, but not beyond the broken promises, the fantasies of those we have entrusted for solutions. They made promises that fuel the flames of the fire of our struggles, leaving people to suffocate from the smoke. The leaders have forgotten their people. They abandoned those who lifted them as they rose to power. Community disappeared at the top of their tower. Their, 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 their tongues became shops that sell lies. The nation is in pain. Masses of people are thankful to the rain. It conceals the evidence of their cries. The children of the rainbow have become mute. Our voices are trapped inside our throats. There are stories of despair that are never shared. We have been misled by the promises of our flags. Together, as we travel through this maze of deception, we must reveal the hidden realities. This nation needs new voices. When everything is a lie, when there is no guideline, when the elders die without showing the light, who must lift us from the darkness? 
who must lift us from the darkness? Who has the time to invest in the young minds? We need to glue together these pieces of this broken glass. We must cultivate and fertilize our own ground. This era necessitates a new focus to, 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 to explore the edges of our motherland. There is more behind the scenes that we see. We will rise from the fires that rage. I go by Mfundi, the poet. Thank you so much. We continue further on with our program, I would just like to say thank you very much for everything you shared with us this evening. Um, we are all the richer for it. This is a, a certificate that we give to everyone who speaks at an FEZS honorary lecture. Um, and you're now part of our, our group of elders, <laughs> our wise ones that we refer to back to. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ravia. Thank you, colleagues. So my new best friend here, Christian Endres, who is the project manager for the Conrad Anders Stifting, uh, a loyal supporter and partner of the last decade or so in support of the ordinary lecture, the only supporter, uh, is saying, Yeki, I want to talk. Yeah, I'm moving, <laughs> coming, coming. Good, thank you. Um, I have to admit, after that last presentation, I'm shaking a little bit. Now, you usually don't get nervous, but now I feel a lot of pressure having felt that rush of blood. You said it's poetry or something. It was certainly something invigorating. Honored speakers, uh, honored guests, Sakani Mulaleke, Auditor General, Prof. Fim, our Vice Chancellor at Stellenbosch University. On behalf of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, um, I'd like to express my gratitude that you are here. Um, also to those online for attending and engaging at the event. And I have a special thanks, of course, for the Frederick von Zell Institute that hosts this event, arrange it, and uh, invest every year to keep the spirit and the values of Frederick von Zell Slubbert alive in our minds. May it continue for a long time yet. So yes, as introduced, my name is Chris Endres. I am a project manager with CAS. And I'm here um, on behalf of my director, Greg Gregor Yecke, who is unfortunately not able to be here right now but he sends his regards and he's probably watching me, so I'd better be careful about what I say. Good, um, that being said, I'm very happy that this event is being streamed uh, online. We've all learned through COVID and been recorded so that I can rewatch what you said. Uh, there was a lot there. I tried to scribble, now I can't read what I wrote because there was so much good stuff. So thank you very much for that. I, I really appreciate that. Um, a few words about the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung or Foundation, Stiftung. We're a think tank closely associated with the CDU, the party of Angela Merkel in Germany. We promote democracy, good governance, and the rule of law, human rights, throughout more than 100 countries worldwide. And we're lucky to have a country office in South Africa focused specifically on South Africa since the 1980s. And we foster dialogue between policymakers, actors from the private sector, and from civil society. Please have a look at our website, www.kas.de forward slash South Africa. It's a particularly interesting time to be in South Africa, as has been mentioned already. It was always interesting in South Africa, but I think now particularly. Not since the 1980s, I think, has the work of CAS been quite as interesting, because it is a turning point uh, we can feel history blowing through our hair, even if I don't have very much. It is happening. Now, 
as we speak, political parties are having to think about talking to each other and listening to each other for the first time in a substantive way in 30 years since CODESA, since the government of national unity. It is a moment of transformation when transformative things are possible. And presentations like this evening remind us when the right people are in the right place at the right time, the right things happen. We all have a, a great responsibility not to be too cynical. It's easy to be cynical. Um, I said to someone, I, I cried a little over the weekend, they said, did you read the news? And no, it was, it was something I watched on TV. But it is a bit like the news in South Africa is often very overwhelmingly negative. And it is so nice to hear a good news story from the Auto General of South Africa about how you're developing young people, how you are a beacon of what young women especially, but all of us can become if we stand up to the challenge and opt in, not just to the public service, but to service to our community. I cannot say how grateful I am that you spoke to us tonight. Prof. Vim, I'm going to come back to you to bring around uh, this conversation. You mentioned the general elections in South Africa next year, in 2024. Um, I, I repeat the statistic wherever I go, and I, every t I have to read it every time because I can't believe it. So in 2021, the ANC got 27% of all the eligible votes in South Africa, and yet that gave them, sorry, in 2019, that gave them more than half the seats in Parliament. Parliament is a representation of us. So I sit in Parliament through my representatives. If that shape is distorted, if the representation in Parliament is distorted, I am no longer represented appropriately, and that is what we're facing with increasingly if young people don't go and vote. Engagement means going to the polls. It means registering beforehand. It means putting your X down. And don't be cynical about it. You will not vote for a party you are happy with. It doesn't exist. But what you can vote for is a party that is an alternative. You can express that you want to be represented. That is important. That is Engaged Citizenship 101. You mentioned this idea of needing a professional public administration. Not all parties subscribe to this idea. You can vote for this idea. I recommend that you do for the sake of my lady, for the sake of my daughters, because that will be the critical difference. At best, we're going to go through at least two electoral cycles without another party having a majority position in parliament. Coalitions are going to be the case. Unstable politics are going to be the case. And we will need to have a public service which is able to act despite the chaos that is raging above. So the X that you make next year makes a difference in terms of whether or not we get a professional civil service. But it's not just the X that you make. Uh, often I say, join a political party, and people say it's a bit much. You don't necessarily need to join a political party to make them better. What you can also do is join your football club. And then say to the football club, I think we need to speak to the parties, because we represent 500 votes, and they'd better listen to what we do. This is how politics works in a lot of countries. It's through associations that aren't necessarily political parties, but that influence political parties at the ground level. All these different associations that you have at Stellenbosch are a potential political vehicle to influence political parties. We mustn't forget that. So banded together to represent ourselves and our interests can be done at any point, not just before an election. So, those are a couple of ideas that I wanted to bring to the table. Thank you so much, Auditor General Sakini Maluleke. It's been an absolute pleasure listening to you. I look forward to the recording and taking more detailed notes. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Right. Thank you so much, Chris, and also to the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung our long-standing partner for over a decade. Um, thank you for sharing in our, our vision at the Institute for creating platforms across South Africa um, for intergenerational dialogue. Um, we look forward um, to continue our partnership with you. 
But let me not take over the job of our senior director, Dr. Choice Macheta, who will do the official word of thanks. Dr. Macheta joined Stellenbosch University in 2019. She obtained a PhD in political science in 2003 at the University of the Free State in the field of elections and the electoral systems uh, South African perspective, and of course, also being very clear about the work of Frederick van Sel Slabbert. She has over 20 years of work experience within the South African higher education sector, and 17 years of these were at senior and executive levels as the vice rector, student affairs and external relations at the University of the Free State, and also as the transformation advisor in the office of the Vice Chancellor and Principal at the Central University of Technology in the Free State. Most importantly, she's my line manager <laughs> <laughs> and the person on our campus who I'm sure our students will attest to with a lot of pa passion and energy for student leadership. Thank you, Dr. Chair. Well, I didn't know that even uh, the person who does vote of thanks get to be introduced in such a spectacle. <laughs> I want to thank each and every person who joined us this evening, our guests, our, our students, everyone, even those people who made this day special. It is a wonderful moment, and I want to say when I got an, an opportunity to meet Dr. Frederick van Seyos-Lavert as a student of political science, I was just too excited in those years and, and excited me to continue with the field of elections and electoral systems. So I get excited when we are approaching an election year. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank our guest speaker, Ms. Sakani Maluleke, your sister, your daughter, Naledi, AGSA team, this is an intergenerational conversation and I'm glad that you came with Naledi. We are inspired and we are empowered and you can believe it now. We opt in, in a big way. Your message tonight does not end tonight. In our environment, the conversation continues. In our co-curriculum work in the different spaces of the university, we will take the work forward. And our duty, our opportunity to serve as the citizens of this country, we will never forsake. South Africa is a beautiful country. Thank you very much for being here. I want to thank our Rector and Vice-Chancellor, Provim de Villiers. Thank you very much for always, always really being here and, and supportive. Prof. Derish Ramjurganath, thank you very much for tonight for conceptualizing the evening. I don't want to forget about Prof. Moyo there. Thank you very much. Uh, these are our members of rectorate who are here and always supporting us. And there are many members of our staff and, and, and we want to say thank you to the students who are here. We want to say thank you very much because we know we, you are inspired. And I want to thank um, Rabia Abba Omar for having the conversation and taking that responsibility. I know how passionate you are about that. I want to thank the Van Slavert family and their friends who are joining us online and some who are in the room. We want to say thank you very much. We will continue this journey and really honor the name and the work of, of Dr. Frederick Van I want to thank the Conrad Aduna Stiftung, uh, Chris Andres, thank you very much and team for being here. You have supported us throughout. I've seen through the years that I've been at Stellenbosch University, every time you are here to support. And I want to thank everyone who made this day special. There's a team at the Center for Student Leadership, Experiential Education and Citizenship who worked very hard to make sure that this day uh, we meet in this way. And all other teams I will not mention by name, but we value the partnerships, we value the community that works with us closely. And I know Professor uh, Figaji is in the space and other guests who are here, 
we really appreciate. Now it's time to enjoy the evening further and continue the conversation. Have a beautiful evening. <laughs>